Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. For years, Turkey turned a blind eye to the jihadists entering Syria. Now, the Islamic State has turned on them. Former Turkish parliamentarian Aykan Erdemir joins me. Turkey, under the Islamist-rooted AKP's rule, resembles to a great extent Germany's Weimar Republic. Increasingly, the President Erdogan calls all the shots. I'm really concerned that Turkey can once again fall into that trap. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. Turkey has been called the Jihadi Highway because of all the fighters, weapons, and money flowing across the border into and out of Syria. Initially, they refused to label ISIS a terrorist organization and turned a blind eye to the cells operating in the country. But as Turkey has painfully learned from terror attacks on its own soil, you can't just turn off jihadism. They've cracked down on the Islamic State, but is it too little, too late? Icon Erdemir was a member of the Turkish parliament currently a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies in Washington. Icon, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Why is the Islamic State targeting Turkey now? It's, it's a very complicated story, and there are different ways in which the Islamic State targets Turkey. Uh, on the one hand, it does target uh, tourist hotspots, uh, I think hoping to get uh, as many foreigners as possible. It also targets Turkey's opposition, Kurds, seculars, liberals, with the hope of uh, gaining the sympathy of the, the Sunni conservative majority. It also targets uh, border towns across the ISIS-controlled territory uh, through Katyusha rockets, and ultimately it also targets uh, Syrian opposition uh, people who are not on the same line with the Islamic State. So there are a different range of uh, Islamic State attacks in Turkey, but I think the latest wave has a lot to do with the fact that now Turkey is turning against them. Yeah, the uh, Istanbul bombing, what, what was behind that in the airport? It, it's difficult to tell, but uh, it, 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 it's part of a chain of attacks that uh, targets tourist hotspots. Uh, there were two other uh, attacks in Istanbul uh, with quite similar MOs. And uh, my guess is uh, the Islamic State would like to kill as many foreigners uh, and from their point of view, n non Muslims were, as possible. These were Muslim um, tourists, essentially, that they killed. When you attack an airport, it's quite difficult to plan you who you get. So in this case, almost all of the victims uh, were Muslims, either Turks or Arabs from other countries. Why did Turkey turn a blind eye to all the jihadists that were flowing across their border into Syria? I think early on, Turkish government uh, had a very simplistic calculation. They thought that you can turn on and off jihadism at will, and they assumed that uh, jihadi violence would lead to a quick downfall of the Assad regime in Syria. And then the Turkish government calculation was, you turn off jihadism, uh, you then uh, bring your Muslim Brotherhood friends to power in Syria, and there would be a friendly Sunni conservative regime in Syria. Now and that did not happen. That did not happen. In fact, uh, people like me in the opposition in Turkey kept on warning Turkey. In fact, we use one phrase quite often. We warned about Pakistanization. We said there have been other countries who use similar uh, tricks, and it always backfired. And we uh, warned them that uh, the snake would finally uh, bite the hand that f has fed it so far. And this is what we're going through today. And there have actually been ISIS cells operating in Turkey that the Turkish government knew about. Is yes. that true? It's true. Uh, and it's, it's not only about ISIS, because there is also the issue of, for example, El Nusra Front. Mm -hmm. uh, until quite late, Turkey actually failed to classify it as a terrorist organization. I remember my time in the parliament pushing various Turkish ministers to classify it as a terrorist organization and they always kept silent about it because back then they thought that you know these al-Qaeda linked organizations could be instrumental in toppling the Assad regime and of course we know that a lot of these soldiers of fortune a lot of these radicals do not necessarily have brand loyalty you know they can start with Nusra or they can start with al-Qaeda they'll end up with ISIS so this is what Turkey is now suffering through because there seems to be uh, kind of a, a sympathizer base in Turkey. People who are kind of in tune with jihadi ideologies, they might provide active support, they might, prov they might turn a blind eye when necessary, 
how much popular support does Islamic jihadism have in Turkey? Now, most people don't want to hear these statistics, but one Pew Research poll uh, showed that 8% of Turkish citizens expressed a sympathy for ISIS. Now, that is over 6 million individuals in a country of almost today, 80 million. So that is a scary amount. And we should also keep in mind that there were millions of others, uh, meaning uh, a significant percentage, who stated that they don't want to answer this question. So only 80% wow. only of the Turkish population could clearly say that they were against ISIS. This I find to be a very troubling statistic. And what's the logical outcome of that? Like what happens when so many people in Turkey support ISIS? Now, first of all, I think both Turkish citizens themselves and Turkey's NATO allies need to take this issue seriously. Uh, now, we shouldn't be too alarmed only from one point of view, and that is, uh, I don't know how this sounds, but a lot of the pro-ISIS sympathy among Turks, I think, are linked to the anti-Kurdish sentiment, mm -hmm. meaning uh, both members of the Turkish government and Turkish public believe that ISIS could be a counterbalance to the Kurdish insurgents, which is, of course, a horrible calculation. And again, it's, it's kind of a lose-lose deal. Turkey is not only losing its Kurdish citizens, the hearts and minds of its Kurdish citizens, but also losing uh, its youth to jihadism. So the, the, the easy way out, of course, would be to make sure Turkey has a successful peace process with the Kurds. Every Kurdish citizen feels in co uh, part of the Turkish Republic, and also the youth have other avenues besides jihadism to express their discontent. You mentioned in the beginning of the uprising in Syria that the, the goal was toppling of the Assad regime and having a friendly government there. Now that Turkey has declared war on ISIS, is that still their top priority, or is it to defeat ISIS? I think uh, until quite recently, Assad was still number one priority. But now I think the Turkish government is coming to the realization that it's impossible to find a future uh, for Syria without Assad. Now, whether this will really make a difference in Turkish foreign policy, time will tell. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that the Turkish government and significant portions of the Turkish public will continue to be obsessed with the Kurdish threat both within Turkey and across the border. And this will continue to complicate matters, especially for the uh, Turkey-US alliance. That's what I was going to ask you, because we're allied with the Kurds. I mean, they're, they've been the most yeah. successful in fighting uh, the Islamic State. So what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis Turkey? Can we ally with Turkey as well? It, 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 it's a very different triangle, because uh, Turkey, the Turkish government will keep on holding on to its skepticism about PYD. And we know that on the ground, uh, PYD has been really the leading fighting force against ISIS. This um, is the Kurdish political movement and its armed wing that operates in northern Syria and has made a lot of gains against ISIS. Now, this should be a cause for celebration for the Western world. Uh, actually, all NATO members celebrated with one exception, and that is Turkey, because Turkey sees uh, the growing presence of a Kurdish entity in northern Syria as a problem. And this fear of a Kurdish entity pushes Turks toward a sympathy for jihadism. Again, a, a very mistaken calculation. Uh, and tur Turkey, instead of finding win-win solutions, always goes for the lose-lose the alternative. So what could we do as far as partnering with Turkey that would be beneficial to both of us? Yes. Now, here comes the million-dollar question, and I think uh, the, uh, the answer, which is not that obvious, is making sure that we discuss security issues together with values and democracy. Because on the American side, the idea was, OK, let's try to maintain a pragmatic relationship with the Turks uh, concerning security issues, and let's turn a blind eye to the withering away of Turkish democracy, rule of law, and institutions. Now, the only way in which Turkey, US, and the Kurds uh, fighting ISIS could work together is if Turkey has a strong, robust democracy, if Turkey has a strong peace process, if Turkey makes peace, makes amend with its Kurdish citizens. And that's not happening. It's not happening because the Turkish government feels 
that the West will keep on turning a blind eye to its excesses. Why? Because the EU needs Turkey for Syrian refugee crisis. The US needs Turkey for the Injurlik air base and the fight against ISIS. So as long as we continue to decouple security from Turkish democracy, Turkey will continue to be a problematic partner at best. So this crackdown now on the Islamic State, is this a permanent shift for Turkey? I mean, can we expect them to have now no longer go back to that part where they're either facilitating fighters or turning a blind eye? Now, when it comes to future course of action, only one person matters, and that is the current President Erdogan, who has been serving either as prime minister or president for the last 13 years. And we know that he is capable of a lot of U-turns, 180 degree turns from Israel to Russia, to the European Union, to the Kurds, to the US. So it's impossible to tell what he'll do the next day. Uh, and I think the only way to make sure that we have Turkey as a predictable and reliable partner is if we can get Turkey back on its uh, democracy track. How likely is that? It seems to be very difficult these days because Erdogan is consolidating power to an unforeseen, uh, to an unprecedented level in Turkish history. And uh, the more he uh, kind of undermines Turkey's rule of law, democracy, parliament, institutions, checks and balances, uh, the less likely Turkey to be a kind of a reliable partner. How many Syrian refugees are there in Turkey now? There are now over 2.7 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people, and Turkey has done a lot to accommodate them. Uh, this is much larger than the, the Syrian refugees uh, in, in Europe. And uh, of course, the, the problem is uh, Turkey has been a great host, but Turkey has failed to come up with institutional incorporative policies to make sure uh, these Syrian uh, refugees have proper education, health care, employment opportunities. So they are continuing a precarious existence. But what kind of impact is that having? Because I know that the, for instance, tourism obviously has gone way down in, in Turkey because of all the attacks. Um, I mean, this can't be easy. It is a difficult issue, but I, I would like to commend the Turkish public because we haven't seen the kind of xenophobic uh, bigoted reactions among the public, although there were 2.7 million refugees. And none of the four main parties in the Turkish parliament uh, follow an anti-refugee policy, although it's very easy to capitalize on that. Especially this these days, given what's happening in Europe. Especially mm. these days. Mm. But it doesn't mean that there is an easy acceptance of Syrian refugees. For example, just uh, last week, President Erdogan uh, dropped a bombshell in Turkish policy scene. He said, I'm going to offer citizenship to all the Syrian refugees without any debate, without any deliberation, without any prep work. And this, of course, led to a huge reaction. And the next day, he had to change his line. He said, no, 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 we will only offer citizenship to the highly skilled Syrian refugees. Now, th this shows something very important about Turkish uh, policy scene, and that is, uh, in the absence of proper deliberative democracy, a lot of policy issues concerning Syrian refugees end up uh, being decided by Erdogan. And this is, of course, a recipe for disaster because it is a very sensitive issue. And from this point on, there is no guarantee that this issue could not be politicized, leading to uh, the, the kind of xenophobic uh, outbursts we have been witnessing in Europe. You were a member of the Turkish parliament uh, up until recently. Why did you leave and come to the United States? Uh, I, I do believe in political change. I do believe in deliberative democracy. But unfortunately, Turkey, uh, under the Islamist-rooted AKP's rule, uh, resembles to a great extent uh, Germany's Weimar Republic, during which the parliament was undermined, during which uh, checks and balances uh, were destroyed, during which separation of powers uh, were eroded. So uh, my time in Turkish parliament, 2011 to 2015, uh, I think there were a lot of attempts to fix uh, the mistakes that Turkey was doing. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, but increasingly the parliament is becoming irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's turning into a rubber stamp. 
and uh, the President Erdogan calls all the shots. So I thought uh, I should better do something uh, else uh, where I have a, a value added. And, and moreover, one other issue was, of course, concern for the journalist colleagues, because uh, if you ask me, my journalist Rolodex is either all in jail I, or wow. fired or in exile. And uh, if you really want to exercise your First Amendment rights, uh, you should better do it outside uh, Turkey, uh, not necessarily out of a concern for my own safety, but out of a concern for the well-being of my journalist colleagues who can easily end up in trouble uh, for quoting me, writing about me, and, and, and giving the opposition a voice. Mm. You mentioned the Weimar Republic. Obviously, something very uh, much worse came after that in, in Germany. Y you're not saying that that's the path that Turkey is on. Actually, those observers who watched Turkey closely since the June 2015 elections are seeing a very dark side to the Tur to Turkish politics, and that is, as the fighting uh, with the Kurdish insurgents escalate, we are seeing uh, over half a million internally displaced people. We are seeing uh, civilians caught in, in the crossfire. We are seeing uh, a reappearance of torture, extrajudicial executions. We are seeing journalists <coughs> uh, thrown in, in dozens uh, to jail. This is not a good trajectory. And, and I hope Turkey can, again, take a U-turn from this horrible path. But simply taking a look at Turkey's last century uh, shows us that there were horrible moments of great pain and misery. Uh, and uh, I'm really concerned that Turkey can once again fall into that trap. I, I know that you've been uh, very outspoken on religious freedom issues. You recently won uh, an, an international award. Um, how is Turkey doing in religious freedom? Now, tur Turkey always had shortcomings concerning religious freedoms. And it, it, it was a difficult transition from the late Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic. The Republic had mm -hmm. uh, very genuine intentions about institutionalizing a secular republic. But in doing so, uh, it did not necessarily have the know-how to incorporate a, a religiously pluralist system. Turkey lacked the institutions and the process and the know-how. So what Turkey ended up with was a quasi-secular system which victimized both the majority Sunnis and all the minority communities. Mm. So when the Islamist <coughs> root of AKP came to power in 2002, there were a lot of hopefuls, uh, hopeful individuals in Turkey who thought, oh, maybe Turkey's pious masses once in power could institutionalize a new regime that's more open to pious people of all walks. Now, this turned out to be a, a let's say, an unfulfilled promise. Turkey continues to have a very mixed record. In some respects, there is a strong reference to a tolerance discourse, uh, accommodation and toler to tolerance of the minorities. But from another perspective, this is actually a guise through which, which uh, minorities are told, you know what, you're second class individuals, know your place, you can be tolerated by the majority thanks to the benevolence of the majority. Whereas the Turkey I dream about yeah. is a Turkey of equal citizenship where every individual, regardless of his or her faith, uh, has the same opportunity uh, to become the president, to become the, the constitutional court head, to, to become a professor or a general, whereas the Turkey we live in today uh, makes you understand that if you're not part of the Sunni majority, you have no place uh, in, the, in the country's top uh, bureaucracy or politics. You know, Turkey had had a lot of issues with some other countries, so let's start with Russia, because mm -hmm. Turkey shot down a Russian jet. Uh, it was near the border with Syria killing both the pilots. Why would they do that? It is still a question a lot of people ask, and uh, interestingly, I'm sure members of the Turkish government still ask that question. Uh, part of the, uh, the, the mystery is President Erdogan, uh, right after the crisis, ha had a very belligerent, belligerent tone. And today, he sounds completely different. He sounds as if this was a mistake that he had no role in, and 
So again, one of these U-turns. One of that these U-turns. Uh, we had the, the exact same with Israel. We might soon have uh, something similar with Egypt. So it's very difficult to guess what Erdogan has in mind. In fact, uh, recently I, I wrote a piece saying uh, that this is a more a weather vane foreign policy and maybe after all there is no content to it meaning uh, as the winds change Turkish foreign policy changes and it only serves one purpose and that is Erdogan's consolidation of power so foreign policy I know this is a provocative uh, hypothesis but this is what I'm arguing it seems lately Turkish foreign policy is simply uh, an outcome of Erdogan's domestic calculations whatever serves his uh, immediate uh, goal at home uh, seems to be Turkey's next pol foreign policy move. Well, I want to ask you, though, about the, the larger agenda for Turkey in the region, because um, they've been a supporter of the Palestinian group Hamas, um, the Muslim Brotherhood. What are they trying to do in the region? What, what's, what's Erdogan's goal? Yes. First of all, uh, since 2002, Erdogan's goal was to uh, reset Turkish foreign policy. What he meant by reset was Turkey's traditional foreign policy was Western oriented. Uh, it cherished uh, Council of Europe membership, NATO membership. Turkey wanted to be a full member of the European Union. And Turkey always turned its eye to the West and was very concerned about secularism. Now with Erdogan came a big difference. On the positive side, there was a proactive foreign policy. On the negative side, Turkish foreign policy became increasingly sectarian. It was increasingly uh, kind of uh, carried forward through the religious uh, identity. Right. Supporting side. the Sunnis or going exactly. against the Shia, exactly. going against Israel. Israel. And so uh, what happened in the early years of the AKP uh, rule, uh, Erdogan had a lot of ambition. Uh, Turkey uh, devoted a lot of time, resources to foreign policy. It was extremely ambitious in hoping to design a new Middle East and, and, and a new world. Now, of course, the, the problem was uh, Erdogan and his narrow circle uh, did not have too much foreign policy experience. They had these uh, grand visions but lacked the capacity, had no understanding of the nuances of realpolitik, and increasingly uh, the, the, the Turkish foreign policy came to uh, a standstill and today what we are seeing is Erdogan going through another reset. Uh, and we, we Trying to make nice with everybody. And we, we call it trying to bring Turkey back to its factory defaults <laughs> and that is the Republican secular tradition. W what, about, what about with the United States? Should we see that, you know, should we expect Turkey to improve relationships with the U.S.? I think Turkey is desperate to increase uh, improve relations with the United States, uh, but in a, in a different sense. Before Erdogan, Turkish-U.S. relationship was more strategic within the NATO, not only as a security alliance, but also as a political alliance, an alliance of Western values. But with Erdogan, I think Turkish-U.S. relationship is more about transactionalism. It's about give and take. So it, it, it's more like a, like a Bazari encounter. It's more like bargaining. What do I get out of this? Now, the problem with this kind of transactionalism is uh, sound and sustainable foreign policy is based on trust, is based on shared values, is based and on we don't have working that with together. Turkey. I don't think Turkey and U.S. Uh, has that anymore. So what do you um, recommend for the next U.S. president to do vis-a-vis -vis Turkey? What, what should... What would you recommend? Uh, what would your policy recommendation be? Sure. T first, realizing that Turkey is extremely important, uh, not for itself, not only for Syria or Iraq, but Turkey is an important linchpin in the Western, in the transatlantic alliances, uh, greater Middle East policies. Second, uh, if Turkey is important, it's not important only for security issues. It's important for uh, advancing our values, that is, free markets, liberal democracy, rule of law in the region. Third, if that is the case, we should never turn a blind eye to those issues and, and make sure Turkey's democracy flourishes alongside its economy and alongside its security potential. Now, what we are seeing uh, in, in, in the last eight years is uh, there was a lot of hope in U.S. of these 
what was considered to be moderately Islamist governments, not only in Turkey, but e even in Egypt. Now, uh, we see that uh, it's, it's almost like a one-way avenue. Once you enter this moderate Islamist avenue, you almost always end up with a majoritarian, authoritarian regime, which is a, a kind of a borderline brutal regime. It can e easily turn on and off violence against its own people, and this, uh, I think, is not a, a good recipe for comprehensive security. Are you expecting more terror attacks by the Islamic State against Turkey? Uh, unfortunately, yes, and it's not only the Islamic State, but we should expect even, uh, also more attacks by the PKK, the Kurdish insurgent PKK, and also its offshoot Tuk. And uh, we are also seeing a resurgence of other jihadi movements in the area. So we shouldn't be surprised if we have uh, either Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda offshoots. Uh, carrying out these kind of lone wolf attacks uh, on Turkish soil. Icon, uh, thanks very much for uh, being on the program. It was a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. This has been the Mimi Gerges Show. You can see all of our programs on whut.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter and leave me your comments there. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.